right. Hello, everybody. Hi. Uh, so you guys have been used to Emily Cosgrove for the last few months, and uh, well, I actually I used to I was the supervisor for uh, Emily's project back when she was a student here at Cata. My name is Chelva Bruno. I am currently where's the webcam? There's the webcam. New setup. New interest in that. My name is Chelva Bruno. I am currently the head lead Unreal artist at a company called Copenhagen Rig. Previously, I have been a teacher here at Cata. I used to do boot camps every week. If you, any of you remember me from back then. Um, I also do miniature sculpting and a bunch of other things that would bore you or confuse you at this point. Anyway, today, I have been invited back for a special Christmas special to show you guys ZBrush. And next week it'll be Blender, and the week after that it'll be Blender, and the week after that it will be Blender, and it'll all be great. Uh, so, yeah, to start with, I can see there's a bunch of you in chat. Yeah. Yeah. And I see somebody says, you're from India, from Ireland, uh, but live in Ireland, visiting family at the moment. Oh, nice. <clears throat> well, welcome to. It's far away you're joining us from. And yeah, everybody else. Where are you from? Where are you joining us from? I'd love to hear. I am working, right? <laughs> uh, let's see if I can move the mic a bit closer. Hello! <laughs> Hi, Tommy. <laughs> Get out of my chat. <laughs> Hello, DevCode. Nice to see you. So yeah, like I said, I used to be a student here at Gata Trumax as well, and I used to um, be quite diligent, I guess. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Hope to be back in teaching one day, so I can make the future of VFX a better place. Hello from the Netherlands, how lovely. <clears throat> There you go. From the Netherlands, how lovely. And hello, Mel. Nice to see you. Yeah. So yeah, today will be hopefully nice and chill. I uh, hope you can follow along at home. Uh, we'll be focusing mostly on talking about um, how we think when we sculpt. Uh, tradi sculpting is a sort of a weird thing inside of 3D because it's probably the closest you'll get to like actual uh, old timey artistic expo like not exposure but experiences where you can really get lost in the flow you don't have to think about a lot of technicality stuff like that and we're just gonna play around with that a little bit today I don't know what Emily's been taking you guys through in the past but Today we'll be doing Dragon, uh, that's what I prepared anyway, and I'll be basing it mostly on uh, some snakes, because snakes are cool, and I've been really into looking at uh, cottonmouth snakes recently, it's a very venomous snake they have in the States, and they have this very interesting head snake or head shape, so we will be basing it on a lot of that. That's perfect. And yeah, so apart from that, uh, yeah, we're actually, I think we're going to go a little bit further than we than I'd usually take you because it's just that type of day. So yeah, one of those things, so like the reason why I'm telling you this is especially if uh, you're a beginner, not necessarily at 3D or ZBrush, but if you're a beginner in art or your artistic um, journey, like you're, you're taking the first few steps in your artistic journey and you're trying to figure out what you want to do, where you want to go, how you want to work with things, um, there's a thing that tends to be neglected a lot or tends to be sort of like thought about as cheating. And that's looking at reference. And I cannot understate how much and how important it is to look at reference for most things so that we work with when we do 
3D or when we do art, if you're doing painting or if you're doing drawing, if you're doing sculpting, things like that, it's really, really important to see like what is it you're going for. And even when we're working with something fantastical like we will be today, it can still be a really good idea to have that in the back of your head. Like, like I'm saying, I'm working out of snakes and lizards today. I'm actually also splitting in toad or not a f turtle there, and I'll show you the turtle later because it's weird. Um, and like in the past, I've done creatures that were supposed to be dragons or supposed to be other type of creatures where I'm told, well, it needs scales, it needs to be basically reptilian, but we really like the shape of capybara. So I'm being told to take a capybara and turn it into a dragon. I've done that. And what really helps is having the reference of a capybara and looking at it. So if I'm just going to pull up, where's my mouse? There's my mouse. There we go. There you go. Let me pull this up and I can just pull up this. So for today, this is my reference board. You can see here, this is a flathead snake. This is a death adder. This is a flathead corkscrew lizard, short snout alligator, and a uh, what did I say? Cottonmouth. And over here, we have a Matamata -mata turtle, which I thought was funny. And we're going to, yeah, we're going to incorporate that. Don't worry. It's going to be fun. But to start with, I'm going to focus on these for basic shapes and stuff like that. I like these big lumps. And this is sort of what I, also what I mean when I'm talking about reference. A lot of the time you just gotta, you gotta look at things, not as the whole, but like as different parts. What do you like from it? So like here, I like this big flat part on the cotton mouth, which was why I actually thought about the cotton mouth. It's also why the death adder is there, um, because it has that sort of same. Yeah, exactly. It, the death adder has that sort of same. Yeah, look at that pixelation though. It's great. It has that sort of same flat head, and it's it's just wonderful. And here we have it from a top view. You can really see it, and also this thing has beautiful scales. Yeah, and you have the snort, uh, short, uh, short nosed American alligator. Um, it's again, again, you get like this almost bulldog ass face of it that it it's so short and so snouted. But look at that jaw, though. Look at that definition of the jaw, and look how that curls up there. It's actually it goes like there and there. This is likely the folds. But so so here's the thing. I like the mouth of this thing, I, but I like the way the jaw looks. I like the way the mouth looks, and I like the way the jaw down here looks. I don't want all this. This is useless to me. So to fill in that blank, I'm going to look at things like this one. Well, I don't like how much these eyes bulge up, but I do like the like slight heart shape that's at the back of the head. But then we go down to the death adder, and you see that's basically just a shovel of a head, like completely flat gotta find the center of the camera here there you go completely flat and that's what we sort of want that's what i want with this because that also allows me to turn out these nice frills from it um so one thing we're going to do here today is i'm actually going to no uh, mm, we're going to sculpt this so it's kind of posed well I, I am uh which means that the inside of the mouth won't be there but yeah not too much of a loss so yeah I'm going to take this away and have it down here as my own little reference point. To start with, in case this is your first... Yeah, exactly, big bite force. In case this is your first... Uh, a quick question regarding the software. As I have never used ZBrush before, what is the difference between ZBrush and ZBrush Core Mini? Get more time with ZBrush Core purchase. So, what we're working in today is actually called ZBrush Core Mini. So it's a mini version of ZBrush which means it's completely free. You can't use it for commercial use. There is a weird clause that you can use it for 3D printing. I don't know if that means it's just not for commercial use as 3D printing, but that's such a small market that I don't think they care. Um, ZBrush Core Mini is a dumbed down, but not, like, not in any way less powerful. It's just you, you have a lot of the functionalities locked away uh, they're actually still, this is still the full software, by the way, 
<laughs> it's just locked behind you eyes. Every now and again, um, I've had both interns and I've had people at boot camps in the past where through a weird combination of pressing and holding down hotkeys, they've managed to access menus that are only available in full ZBrush. <laughs> so that can happen. But ZBrush Core Mini is free forever. You can just continue on working with it. And I, and I, I kind of would recommend that because you remove all the fancy things. You remove the worry that you need to um, work with you need to worry about topology and you need to worry about how things work and uh, the way things are merged together. This just lets you work purely with form. And that's kind of what we want to do. Um, with that said, the principles I'll be talking about today, the sculpting principles, doesn't matter what software you're using. Um, let me just be quite honest about that. Sculpting is less about tools and more about how you not even how you use them but like the principles you use to look at things that's also where the reference comes up and i can uh, like uh, where the hell did I, there I put that. so like even here i can pull up this because you can get sculpting softwares for your tablet there you go i can see the big reflection as well but yeah, like this is still the trial version and I have no less ability to work with this than I do ZBrush. It's just, you know, this I can take on my travels. It, I'm bound by tablet hardware, but you know, that's, that's, the, that's what you get when you're going. I'm going to work with a tablet uh, in my trip while I travel. Just went to Stockholm for the weekend and not, you know, sitting at my giant production ready PC and sitting in ZBrush. So that really changes the way you work. It, it doesn't really change the way you work. It just changes, you know, how much you optimize, how much detail you go in. So, all right, to start with, so you can see I've made a little face. Now this is on purpose because I need to show you guys how to navigate around ZBrush. First of all, we need to stop something. ZBrush has perspective. But ZBrush has very poor perspective, so we don't want it to be turned on all the time. So we're going to take our mouse, we're going to drag it all the way up here. And you can see this perspective distortion. Can any of you guess what that means? That means it's not true to perspective, it's distortion to mimic this perspective, right? Just going to tick that off. It's going to look a lot better. It's going to be easier to work with. Don't turn on perspective unless you're doing faces. And when I talk about faces, I'm talking about like trying to make my face, not a stylized face, a realistic face. That's the only time you need to do that. All right. So, navigating around in ZBrush, we can left click out here in the gray, and this will allow us to orbit around our little man or our ball and this is why I was I, I drew on mine because else this would look like that and it would be hard to perceive what the hell is going on so here you can see I can orbit around I can orbit up and down if I hold down shift I will snap to a particular view or a orientation or I can just drag this dude up here and get exactly the same result if I hold down control and click I can zoom in and out smoothly. If you have a scroll wheel, you can also do this. No, nope. oh, the scroll wheel found something else, nice. They listen to feedback. Um, but yeah, you can see here I can zoom in and out very smoothly, very nicely. And if I hold down Alt, I can move my 3D object around my scene in case you know I need to get underneath a specific part of the lip. Now, what happens if we've zoomed so far in that we cannot find gray space? Well, we have two options here. One of them is you can see you have this nice little outline here, this white outline going all across. This is so that you can go outside it and actually drag around inside ZBrush. Or you can right click. Yep, that's right. Right click anywhere. And you can do exactly the same things as you could before. Control for zooming in and out. 
Alt for panning, right click on its own for orbiting, right click and shift to snap to a specific view. Now, do I need to repeat any of those before I go on? Because I'm, I, 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 this is really because you guys, if you are here because you want to know how the software works and the navigation is sort of, oh, there's a lot of hotkeys and stuff like that. And I understand if you don't get it the first time. So do lay it on me. And if not, I'm going to wait the customary 10 seconds before, you know, uh, this chat and the stream catches up to me. And then I'm going to continue. And there you go. Hydrated and caught up. So the first thing I'm going to do here, full disclosure. All good, great. So I'm going to go up here into the top left-hand corner. And you can say new sphere mesh for sculpting. Boop. It's going to prompt me if I would like to save. I would not. This is not my best work. Setting up Wacom drivers. Great. This is not my best work. And here we go. New sphere. Turn off perspective. And we are ready to start working. So we're going to do mostly the head, maybe a bit of the neck today. And then we'll work on from there. To start with, to start with any sculpt really, it doesn't matter if you're making a person or if you're making a dragon or if you're making a seahorse or if you're making an owl, anything. You need to get the basic shapes done. And to do this, we don't use a sculpting brush because this is, as you can see here, this is going to take a lot of time to get this starting to look like anything. So we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is going to go out here on our left hand side and we can see we have what is it? We have about 12, yeah, we have 12 tools. We have eight sculpting brushes and then four projection brushes. And these are the last ones we're gonna use, so don't worry too much about them right now. We're gonna use them later. To start with, we're gonna use the move brush. Move. Now the move brush allows us to move around our mesh. This is really useful because we can start shaping the, our mesh the way we want. Right now, my move brush is very small and it doesn't allow me to do a lot. What do I then do? What, well, I change the size of it, of course. So this, if you're sitting with your mouse, you can see here, scrolling on my scroll wheel, this allows me to make it bigger. This is really cool for you guys. I don't have that option. So this allows you to just change your mouse's size on the fly. Really cool to make small tweaks fast. Like, you don't need to set up, have a tablet to be able to sculpt. Um, I know one <laughs> extremely good sculptor who, for the first, he, he says for the first five years of sculpting, even professionally, he never used a tablet. He used the mouse. He thought the tablet was a waste of time, and then he changed the tablet and said, okay, just a lot faster. But you can do it. Like, you said, like I said, five years, four or five years, five years, just on the mouse. You can do it. Trust me. So... For the rest of us, or for those of us who are setting up our Wacom driver, drivers, Q1 drivers, anything like that, we have the S key on our keyboard. And this will bring up a little slider. It's also up here in the third, upper third left corner. It's gonna be really confusing later. Um, and here we can change the size and we can see, I can also change it uh, by pressing S, the slider will come to my mouse, which is great. And now I can start to shape this. And you can see I am... So there are different philosophies on how to shape things. Um, and it's not as much like the philosophy of, oh, how much of the basic shapes you block out. Everybody agrees as much as possible much as possible get the shape in there first but it's the way you get there i use something that i've recently figured out is called the morse code method which is i tap the screen constantly you can see the 
circle around my mouse. It disappears whenever I click. I tap my screen constantly and I make these tiny, tiny movements, tiny, tiny adjustments. And this is one of the wonderful things about 3D. A lot of the time, there is no right or wrong way to do things. There's just a right outcome. So as long as my basic shape when I'm done with this looks all right, it doesn't matter if I work with big, big movements, I do like this and go here and move up. That doesn't matter. Or if I do that, or, come on, there you go. Or if I use small movements like this and I can go back and forth. And this is like true with most 3D. Even if you're modeling things, there's no right or wrong way to model things. There is a right or wrong topology for your model, the way edges run across them. But you don't need to have, like the process of getting there might be more or less messy and that's just perfectly fine. Um, I teach, I actually teach a class at the Uni Technical University of Riga, uh, 3D 101 for game designers. And they are so confused by the principle that there's no right process, but there's a right myth 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 methodology. And by that, I mean, as long as the result's the good thing, as long as the result works, then, 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 then that's not wrong. Less and more effective ways of working really depends on who you are, what your st how much, like what studio you're at, and stuff like that. So, let's get this flat up here. Just move. You can already sort of see what I'm trying to do here, hopefully. Like this will be flattened out. This is the top of the head. This will be flattened out. Do need to make a little bit more room here at the back because our skull, and that's with most animals, like you don't want the front part, the, the, the part where you bite things to also be the place where your brain is. Uh, so you keep your brain at the back of your skull. So we gotta make a little bit of room for like a brain case over here in the back. I'm not too worried about how flat or how not flat it is right now because I have a secret weapon coming up that's gonna help me work that out. Um, there's also a few bugs that we will be running into while working and I am going to explain to how to fix them when we do run into them, but I need to run into them before we can do that. So yeah. So I've been talking a lot. Do any of you guys have questions about like 3D, the industry, stuff like that? Uh, who am I and where's the, where's the nice and talkative Australian girl, stuff like that? You bring them on. More questions you give me, the easier my job gets. So, oh yeah, and I have uh, my lovely assistant Christian shit uh, outside in the hallway because it is boiling hot in here when I'm sitting uh, who is moderating the chat and uh, assisting all of you with download links links to everything else stuff like that he should also be dropping in a link to the Keda Trumax discord where y'all can drop off images of your models uh, and you can uh, and we can either review them next week, or if we're done very quickly today, we can review them this week. I don't much mind. Um, because that's that's always just fun. It's hard to evolve as an artist in a vacuum. Like, you need to have feedback. There's only, like, one or two artists I've ever heard of who worked completely independently in a vacuum. And I th think they are more, like, they, they, they do not prove that you can. They are more the proof of uh, there will always be somebody who can figure out a way of doing it. Uh, Def Code is asking, any special consideration needed for creating models for game dev, or would you just start the same way as this, or only consider that after a certain point? So it really depends. So if I am... 
if I'm creating a model for a game, and I'm creating, let's say, let I'm creating a creature that you're going to fight in a MMO or something like that. Well, it's a creature, it's biological. I jump into ZBrush uh, at the first stage. If I have a good idea for it, I would just make it. I do that quite a lot. If uh, I got concept art from an art director or a concept artist or the art department, I would start working from that, getting that to work, realizing that a lot of 2D work doesn't necessarily translate as soon as it actually hits the 3D world or the three dimensions. There's a lot of things you can do with tricking light and perspective and stuff like that in 2D that you just simply cannot do in 3D. So, uh, and then I would start simply sculpting. Start making things up, general body plan. What does this need to look like? Is it a sneaky thing? Is it a big, strong, scary thing? What, what am I working with? I'd simply start sculpting that. If I got free reign, then I would start thinking about, well, what does it need to do? And a lot of the time in game dev, especially, you need to think, well, what does the shape of my creature need to communicate to be able to be understood in a mechanic sense? Um, sometimes it can just be, you know, a cool creature for a cool creature's sake, but a lot of the time they need to be able to be understood before you ever engage them. If you see a big, big, strong, hulking creature with like its head down below, below the shoulders and it has a big horn on its nose, you know you don't want that thing to charge at you. And that's a thing to think about when you're being told, this is a creature that jumps down from the trees and attacks its enemies stealthily. Then I'm not going to make a big rhinoceros creature because that's not stealth. That's, that's, uh, I'm big, I'm here and, uh, don't, don't get it. Right. And the, the vice versa as well. If I was going to create a, a big hulking creature, I wouldn't be looking, I might be looking at snakes, but I'd be looking more like pythons and stuff like that. But I'd be looking at, at creatures that could communicate and the shapes and the silhouettes of things that could communicate stealth and l like the lithe uh, ability to move around unheard and unseen and stuff like that more than I would be focusing on uh, strength and bulkiness. So I'd be making a lot more sleek shapes. It'd look more at cats than bulldogs, if that makes sense. Um, and I mean like a panther or a house cat or a cheetah. I wouldn't be looking at a lion. I wouldn't be looking at a uh, Siberian tiger, stuff like that. Because that would just be silly. Those things are giant. They're not stealthy. They're ambush predators. That does not mean stealthy. So yeah. I am getting to sort of a place where I like it. But, and here's the point. I'm also critical about my own work. And that's a good and a bad thing. And that also means it's a good and a bad thing for you guys to be critical about your own work. Because I'm getting a very narrow profile here. Oh, I got one of the bugs. Great. Every now and again, your camera's going to lock to a specific gimbal. And you can see here, it says, oh, rotate on y-axis. And I can tap this, and nothing happens, and I'm still rotating on y-axis. Rot click on this one, and I'm free again. That's a lot of precision, though. So if it ever just locks to one axis, oop. let's see if I can get it to do it. I cannot. If it ever just locks to one axis, just grab this head and this will free it again. Because you can see again, I'm technically locked to one axis, but I have free movement. That's not what we want. So when, not if, but when your ZBrush locks to that one axis, grab your little dude here. This is what he's made for. He's here to help. So before that happened, um, like I said, being a little bit critical is not a bad thing because I can see this is not the vision I was going for in my head. I am very lithe. This is like because I was talking about stealth predators and cats and stuff like that. And I actually wanted this to be a bit broader. I wanted it to be like a, a little bit like a shovel, probably. 
Still want it to be fairly sharp in the front, but I want the back to be a bit broader because that's giving us a bit more like strength and majesticness to it that we really, or that I want with my design, want to communicate through simple silhouette. And that is the thing I'm looking at right now. I'm not, not going to look at the details yet. I'm going to look at the details when we get to the details. I'm looking at the silhouette. I'm looking at how does this look? How, w if I encountered this in an MMO, or if I encountered, if I saw this in a movie, because it doesn't, like, you sculpt for movies as well. What would this communicate? Well, it's a bit sharp. It's big and strong, so it's likely dangerous. It's likely going to hurt our protagonist. Um, so, so yeah, that, that, those are things, shape languages, the way these things work, that is things you should consider. If you're working, if, like Def Code, if you're working on a game, then these are definitely things you consider. Not with everything. Some things, like a deer, it's just a deer. But deers are also, f like, hella scary if you see, like, how many people they kill every year. Or if you've ever heard them, like, scream. Oof. Uh, I realized, oh, locked again. I realized I was doing something there without telling you guys what it was, and that's not okay. So let's go back and do it. So every now and again, you'll have something, like I had this, and I wanted to get rid of that. And if we hold, god damn it, this is happening a lot right now. If I hold down shift and then drag my mouse over something, this will activate the smooth function. Now, this smooths out anything you go over. So this means you don't want to use it as soon as you start detailing because it's just going to destroy and eat through your details. But I can use it right now to get a cleaner shape. It's one of the ways I can get a cleaner shape because I have multiple ways of getting clean shapes. You can see here, what it also does is now I press Shift F. And that just shows me the line fill or this one, this button here. Um, and that shows me what is my mesh looking like. So if I do that, all these big squares and stuff like that you see here, that's the default. That's what you're getting from just pressing the sphere. As soon as you hold down shift, it's gonna start creating more geometry to work with. This means it smooths things out. It also means you have more geometry to work with, which isn't always great. Um, you don't always want a lot of shift, holding down shift is the hotkey for smoothing. It's not really a hotkey, it's just, you know, activating a function. And as you can see, if you make your mouse, or if you make your brush bigger, like I can make mine real big, and then that's just gonna eat my entire model, and you don't want that. So you do wanna be kind of gentle with the shift, or with the, well, with the smoothing and just simply work it through. And now I can see a bit more, like I have removed some of the parts of the silhouette that was bothering me. I can see a bit more here, and I should like this to be a bit sharper, a bit more angular. So I'm just gonna pull out, see here, I'm just gonna pull this out, and then I'm gonna flatten this a little bit and pull this out so we get a more square jaw. Um, Cause that's generally the way jaws work, they're not very rarely perfectly round. They might look it underneath muscles and stuff, but you know. And yeah. So I wanna flatten out the head of this a little bit more. So normally I would wait a longer time before introducing this tool, but today we're actually gonna use it. Coming out here on your left-hand side, you can see there's one called H Polish. This is your high polish. That's actually what it stands for. And what it does is it flattens things for you. And when you flatten things down, you get this nice flat shape, oddly enough. So that means that nice flat head that I wanted, I can now actually just start to get. Every now and again, I do find that it's a little bit aggressive and I need to fill in things again, but I still want those fills to be sort of flattish. So instead of undoing or going back and filling it in and then I'm doing it again, I can actually do, uh, I can use the H polish brushes alternate function. So if I hold alt down, you can see here, it's still flattening things out, 
but it's doing it by filling in instead of removing. And that's just a really nice function. And that all brushes we have, even the move brush, has an alternate function. Now the alternate function of the move brush is instead of being able to move freely around like this, is to go in and out based on the point and the angle you clicked with. So if I hold down Alt, you can see here, it's just going in and out. Well, if I don't hold down Alt, I can move in every direction I want. Yep, and that's just great. It just works really, really nicely. Um, and it's nice that it, it's so, even though we only have eight sculpting brushes, we actually technically have 16. Well, 19, because you also have smoothing. Because each brush has the alternate function that allows you to work a little bit with the set tool in its opposite manner. So that actually does really nice. Oh, so H polish. Just going to flatten this out. And let's flatten out the side here a little bit, just so we get a bit more angular. Like, I do want this thing to be a little bit dangerous, a little bit evil, and we should get to that later, actually. Uh, or we are going to get to that later. And also, sometimes you're sitting and sculpting, and you're sitting and changing the shape of things, and you can sort of get lost in what it is you're trying to do. So when that happens, you can start to sculpt again. Or you can use the H polish and you can sort of remove a lot of things and you can start defining the planes. That's likely a thing you've heard of like the planes of a face that you have. Uh, there you go. Planes on your cheek that go up. This is an area that tends to follow the same angle. On top of your uh, cheekbones, you have another angle. Your nose, sides of your nose, your upper lip. Like all these planes of the face or planes of bodies, things like that, make it very, very easy to start realizing, oh yeah, this is what I wanted to do. This was my vision. This was what I wanted to start by doing. Or you can start to see, well, my original idea was kind of shit. I should rethink it or I should rework it into being something new. That happens all the time. Like Sometimes the things we want to do simply don't work. And that's okay. We had an idea. And we like it, it's the it's the age old one where it, with like the master has tried has failed more times than you've ever tried. Right. So every now and again, try something and fail it. Fail it spectacularly and then learn from it. Because that is a great way of becoming better. And that is one thing I want. I want better 3D artists. I want better sculptors, texture artists, animators out there so that we can make better work. And then I want all of us to be paid properly. Support unions. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you can see now I've flattened out a lot of things. I still have the heart shape from the uh, from the, uh, the flat headed something something lizard. See, now I forgot the name because I've been talking. Uh, could use a little bit more here, but not too scuffed about that. So I want to do one final thing. I want to find the placement for the eyes of this. So I'm going to go back. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to go back here with my move brush. I'm just going to start figuring out how far ahead, how far in front do I want my eyes? And the reason why it's important to put down your eyes now is because the eyes are such a focal point for human beings. Um, and most of the time, what we're creating is for human beings to look at. Um, I don't know what dragons tend to look at because they don't exist, sadly. And if they did, they would likely have a different thing to focus on. But we as human beings like to focus on eyes, so we do need to make sure that the eye placement is good and fitting with whatever it is we're doing. It's also one of the reasons why it's so uncanny when things have a disproportionate amount of eyes to their face. Like if they have more eyes or if they have an uneven amount of eyes, it becomes very creepy. If they have like parallel eyes, it 
it's still creepy, but we can sort of be okay with that. We'll just focus on one pair. While, yeah, give something five eyes, three eyes, 16 eyes, 17 eyes. That's going to be weird, and it's going to not look... It's not going to look aesthetically pleasing, but maybe that's not what you want. And that's okay. So, I'm going to start figuring out where I want my eyes. And I'm sort of thinking of putting the eyes further forward than you would normally do. Like, first instinct is to place the eyes here. You can sort of see that works. It's typical dragon. <laughs> yeah, uncanny valley horns. Yeah, what would like it could be cool if dragons just focus on horns and nothing else. I, I think I, I think I want to place the eyes here. Like this is very far forward and it's kind of Yeah, no, that works. Let's work let's do this. This is good. And I just want this, I want it to be, oh, let's make that a bit bigger. I don't want this to be too much, but I do want the indent there so that I know this is my eye. This is how my eye will be and where it will look. Because then the next thing comes, and that is we need to start defining the other features of the face. Um, and the two main features we need to do, because this is going to be a dragon, so we should focus on a mouth and then we should do nostrils and ears because it needs to be able to hear and, you know, smell. And then we need to think about bony landmarks after that. So let's start with the face. Next to our H, or not the face, the mouth, God. Next to the H polish one, you'll see one called slash. And that's the one we're gonna use. The slash cuts into your model. And you should have a fairly small brush for this because it actually does it quite big for some reason. When I say for some reason, it's not that I don't know that it does it quite big. It's that the developers thought that it should do it by standard. Um, so, yeah. And here is when I'm going to start looking at my alligator or as people in Florida calls them, swamp puppies. And I'm gonna pull this mouth fairly far behind because that is what alligator do. There you go. It's still fairly big, but I'm not too worried about that because I can always go in and I can tighten that up later um, if I want to, and I do want to, so I will. But right now, I'm not too, too fussed about this. I can also, like, when I've done this, I can still go in and say, ah, oh, well, this is a nice solid line, but I don't, I don't, oh, I want a bit more shape in there. So I can still go in with my move tool. And you can see here, I can really start to move things around. It's going to shape so that the overall shape there, but that's okay. Is it? Is it not? It also, because we're working in 3D, we're virtual, right? Try things. Don't be worried about making mistakes. This isn't white paper. This isn't clay where you have to redo a bunch of work. You're destroying your old work. If you make a mistake, Control and Z on your keyboard, just undoes them. You pretty much have unlimited undoes in ZBrush Core Mini and ZBrush Core and ZBrush and whatever softwares you do. If you're sitting in sculpting in Blender, you only have 75 by default. Change that. So yeah. Do, 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 do. So we can go in, we can either tighten this up if we want to, or we can change the shape of it entirely. Now that completely depends on what it is we want to do. What is it I want to do? I want to do, I want to do this. Yeah, so B Blaze is saying that uh, they bought a tablet and a few years ago and to sculpt and seabrush and never got anywhere with it, blah, 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 blah. So that tends to happen. Um, you'll follow some tutorials on YouTube or on online, you'll buy a course, and when that's over, you realize you don't really know where to go from there. And that's sadly a, like a truth for like, I, I, I want to lowball it and say 60, 70%, but I think it's closer to 80% of people who try and learn 3D on their own. Um, I'm, with that, I'm not saying you can't, you definitely can, but a lot of the time having a group of people around you who are interested in learning 3D as well as 
exploring, giving positive feedback, giving negative feedback, giving, creating a system that more or less keeps you perpetually inside 3D is difficult if your friends are not already 3D nerds, right? Um, and a lot of the time, tutorials online aren't interested in teaching you things, they're interested in showing you how to do a specific thing so you come back for the next thing. It's, I understand why. It's not a, it's not a business model I'm particularly a fan of, but I understand why you do it. Um, so, yeah. I prefer to talk about principles. Like, yes, I'm explaining what these tools do and how we use them, but like, realistically, I've shown you how to draw a line and how to move around digital clay and how to flatten it off, right? These tools exist in all 3D sculpting softwares and hell, I'm pretty sure you could even use them in some modeling t contexts as well. So it's not like I am working with black and arcane magic here. So adds, is anybody with me that this looks too friendly? Like it looks like it wants to help you and I don't, that's not what I wanted here. So let's give that, let's go back to the swamp puppy look a little bit. B Blaze told me, wait, what am I waiting for? What do you need me to tell you? Speak, God damn it. speak. Uh, Mel, it's all right. I think there's a VOD coming up in the future that you can just watch things on, if I remember correctly. Christian, tell me if the VOD's still a thing. Yeah, exactly. Step into my suitcase at the budding, set the alligator to the budding 3D plan. And that's sort of what I want to go for. Like you get a Louisiana charlatan in there and get it real good and, and slithery and, and sultry. We will be talking and getting in to great money funds. Yeah. Yeah. Play with, mm, please don't make me say that. Uh, but yeah, do that, get it, like have fun with it. Really, truly, like the best way of getting good at 3D is learning to enjoy it. Um, is not feeling like it's a necessary part, not feeling like it's something that you just need to learn and overcome to get good at whatever it is you want to do, game development, 3D modeling, 3D printing, things like that. No, 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 no. The thing you need to do to get good at it is love it. And once you do that, well, you're going to get good. Trust me, there's no way around it. Uh, Def code. I'm it fetch the game like the one you play with dogs, or uh, is it something else? In a model like this, am I able to open the mouth? No, not currently. Um, but I would be able to fix that problem either later inside Blender, or if I wanted to. I could probably fix it here, but it would be a bit of an annoyance. Generally, if you want a model with an open mouth, you need to sculpt it with an open mouth. So. Okay, that's fine, Death Code. Great. I thought it was some weird young term that I didn't understand. I'm not that old, but you know. So let's go there, smooth that out a little bit. What are you guys feeling about like an underbite? Wouldn't that be a bit cool? Oh yes, Def Code, that is absolutely, like 3D vignettes is, are, are absolutely amazing. Um, 
they're fun to make, they're easy, they're low effort. Once you make one, you can reuse assets into a different one. Um, it's it's just great. And that's like what DevCode is talking about is making those small cute scenes or vignettes where you're just like, you make a little room, you put in two walls that like cut off that area. And that, that like, that is a very, very uh, awesome thing to do. Um, and they, it does bring a lot of joy because you get quick and lovely results. And you're not, because they're so quick to do, they tend to also be like, if you fail, you're not failing a giant project. So you're just, you're not just going to say, well, I'm not good at this anyway. It's like, no, nobody was. I wasn't particularly good at 3D when I started. I got good. Um, and I think that's, that's probably the way it is for everybody. Like, I know people who did never went to school for it. They didn't have YouTube back when they learned it. They learned it from simply doing it. And I can tell now that I went to a school to teach or to learn it, and I am, I know more functions than they do, uh, which is great fun. Cute. I mean, these are just mainly stationary. This would be mostly done, but even then, like you can't use a sculpt for a game model. You would have to do something called a retopology on top of it. And depending on how much time we're gonna spend, we can always, we could probably do a retop at the end of this. I don't like these little nubbins I've made. All right, so I wanna make that underbite and I wanna make it big and strong. So instead of using my move tool, I'm actually gonna go up here into the top. In the top, we have our two main sculpting brush, brushes. And it's sort of a religious thing, depending on which one you want to use. There's not a right or a wrong one. One of them has this very nice soft effect on things. You can see it creates soft tubes. The other one, which is the one I like to use, is called clay buildup. It does very hard and harsh lines. So, Figure it, play around with both. Well and truly play around with both and figure out which one you like. I really like clay tubes mostly because it allows you to make mistakes or it allows you to make a brush stroke that you didn't think would look the way it did and then you can suddenly see where the magic is. By planning everything out, by trying to get everything perfect, you a lot of the time miss better design decisions that will simply come out of human error. Um, and this is one of those weird things that like, I, uh, yeah, they can be nice for scars. They can be nice for muscle fibers. Like I can go in here and I can say, well, these muscle fibers from the neck, they attach below the jaw and to the base of the spine, right? Or at the base of the skull. So I can go in here and I can actually start like, this is going to start looking like muscle fiber. And I can crisscross them if I want a more dense one. And then we're just going to smooth it out a little bit. And because that's smooth, because this whole thing looks biological, that now looks like this lizard is roided up and that its skin can barely contain its muscles. And that's cool. That allows you to also understand that it's still a sketch. It allows you to start planning out underlying muscularity. And it helps your brain, because every now and again in art, we got to cheat our brains. Our brains are our worst enemies, trust me. I'm liking that underbite. I'm liking it a lot. Well, that's... Yeah, let's try and see if we can do something more with that. Yeah, so it really depends on if you like doing harsh lines or soft lines. Again, there's no right or wrong in doing harsh lines or soft lines with this. You just, you have to figure out which one you prefer because the end result is still going to be fairly smooth. Like. I still need to smooth a lot of these things out to get them to look correct, and I will lose a lot of my harshness, but the process there of having my harsh, sketchy lines allows me to be a bit more free with my way of thinking. I like that. Let's, again, 
go back to H polish and then just smooth that out a little bit so we get the shape defined a bit more. But yeah, we're getting that little bit of a bulldoggy underbite. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. You, you get no respect from yours at all. <laughs> Do you mean your snake or your, uh, your, uh, what's it called? Your dragon or your 3D? model in general. Boop. Let's make that heavy. Yeah. Can we remove that and see what that does to it? And again, look, because I'm working in 3D, I can just suddenly start to remove this, see what that does to the silhouette. And that is exactly like yeah. Hey, that's the way it starts. You should have seen my first sculpt. They were ugly. Like, they were not good. They were, like, objectively speaking, dog shit. And I've also been down in, like, artistic slumps where I haven't done a lot of art. And then I go back and, you know, it feels like I've forgotten how to do half the things. You just gotta get back into it a little bit. And that's okay. You gotta, like... We're human beings. We gotta allow ourselves to be better and to get better, to start somewhere and then get better from there. But you don't need to be afraid to ruin him. That's the thing, press control S, you've saved. And then you can try and ruin him. And then you can either control Z, go back and unruin him or open the old file. You won't be, you, you will still have him. We can have as many different copies of this. This is not clay, this is digital. This is ones and zeros. And it's one of the reasons why I think 3D is actually really, really good for beginners, because you'll start to get interested in things like uh, sculpting. I got really interested, I, like I got really interested in texture painting and then I got really interested in watercolors, like painting with watercolors. And you realize that there's a big crossover between the skills of painting with watercolors and the skill of p texture painting. Because it doesn't matter that, you know, you can't transfer your, the way your hand moves, but you can transfer the look. And you can transfer like, well, I know watercolors sort of get this desaturated look in the center and then high, more pigmented it. Well, mine does at least because I drop a bunch of alcohol on them. Not drinking alcohol, but like cleaning alcohol because it makes the pigment spread out to the sides and gets this really cool effect. So you get all these bunch of really nice and you start to realize that artistic things are great. Weep. Yeah, look at that boy. That's not a face you want to meet on the way home on a dark evening. And yeah, so also the, just to remind you y'all, like the alternate function of the clay brush, uh, clay tubes brush, clay, clay buildup brush is digging into your model. Uh, and I just used that to create a little hole for a nostril and a little hole for a ear. And it doesn't need to be more than that because already that's gonna give it enough definition to sort of feel like it could exist in the world. Because it's now having, uh, like, it's having the things that most creatures have, like fish have ears. It's as weird as that sounds, fish have ears. And it's just an evolutionary thing that we and the rest of the world sort of have. Yeah, well, you live in a bad part of town, Christian, so... So, yeah, and as you can see here, like my basic shape, this is reading like, like a dragon. This is starting to read like a dragon. There are things we can do and there are things we are going to do. Like if I wanted to start adding scales to this guy, I could start going fairly big shapes. I'm just gonna round out here. Let's do like this and I can go 
Let's make a center one because snakes and lizards tend to have that. Yep. And then I can start building out on the side. Let's make a little one here, a little one here. And smooth that all out. We're going to start getting this like very, very crocodilian feel to my scales. Why is my clay buildup like a slash and not making a hole? So is it very small and doing like that? So if your buildup is very small, then you will be getting these clay buildup things. Like it, they will start looking like a slash. If you then go, oh, and also, if you just press and hold, it's not gonna do anything. You need to do like, you need to dig it in need to keep on just twirling in the same circle and that will sort of get it out there. So there you go. And yeah, you can see like that's already like built up very quickly, smoothed it out. That's starting to look like you would expect a crocodile scale or even like a lizard scale to look like. Um, it's just very quick. I, I'm not even going to say dirty because it's not, but it is just very quick to work with. Yeah, you get there. And it's, it's generally like a thing that all of you do need to be aware about when you're seeing both me and YouTubers and whatever else when you see these people sculpting. If they're like me, like I work for eight hours a day with 3D one way or another. I am at a, like I am at an advantage to anybody else who's doing it as a hobby or who's doing it on the side of other studies or anything like that, because I get to like my work is also practice. I will get better every minute I spend on this. And so will you. Every minute you spend, you'll be better. But I'm just doing it. I'm getting paid to do it for eight hours a day, so I tend to get better quicker. The same thing, like, I also do it when I get home. I don't stop just because I, uh, I'm coming home. Like, I, <laughs> my daughter is three years old and loves ZBrush, which is great fun. It does mean I don't get to sit in ZBrush, but my daughter likes sitting in ZBrush. And yeah. A lot of the time, just spending that extra time, um, sometimes I can definitely, I can look at things and I'll go, this doesn't look good. I do, and, it, oh, it's, and it's never going to look good. And I'll spend two hours extra and I'll go, I still don't like the way it looks, but it looks good now. Because it doesn't need to necessarily fit the way I like things to look. But I can definitely tell that like adding extra details, refining shapes, all these things make something look good. Which is also an important skill as an artist in general. Something might not be to your taste, but you should be able to look and tell if it's done well or if somebody with that specific taste to uh, would like that. Like I can, I, I've been shown uh, things that are just not, like it's just not my scene, it's just not my uh, world like furry art not furry porn but furry art and I can go well technically speaking this is very very well done I can see that your mastery of color light and texture in your drawings and in your 3d graphics are good um, it's not my cup of tea but I can see what you're doing is good and that's that's a really really important thing it's, the, it's like it's looking at uh, paintings in a history museum and then looking at paintings from somebody who's learning to paint is going like the history museum guys well they spent their entire lives on doing these things so of course they're good the guy who's just learning to paint and has done it or girl sorry um, has, is just learning to paint has done it for a few weeks and is really into it of course there's gonna be some things that they're missing but they haven't spent 60 years doing it yeah And, and it is important. And it is also important for 
beginners to allow themselves to be beginners because that's one of the things that is what, what's the famous line from dune that is the mind killer fear is the mind killer beginners just kill themselves and shoot themselves in the foot before they ever start because well they weren't good at it the first time they did it first they did the donut from blender guru and then they tried to make a chair and the chair looked like shit now they don't know what they do and that is of course it's gonna look like shit like I said, my first sculpt looked like shit. You gotta allow yourself to learn. You gotta allow yourself to grow. You gotta allow yourself to learn. Become better artists. Become better people. Yeah. Yep, so I'm still just working on scales. And, like, sometimes you want very very unique scales that you cannot find anywhere else and then you need to yeah they do and look this is just clay buildup i just went over it like this and then smoothed out and oh so this is probably actually a thing i should say you don't need to smooth out everything you can smooth out just one side of things and that's what i'm doing to get this very sharp inner hole here I'm smoothing out the outside but not the inside so i still have the bump that comes with a nostril, but the hole becomes a very, very sharp inlet. It's not a 90 degree angle, but it's a very sharp angle anyway. Uh, Modes is saying allow yourself to move away from your artwork and then coming back to it. Yeah, a lot of that. And then also just allow artwork to stop. Like, don't... And I'm not very good at that. I have I have a project graveyard that's, I think I checked it yesterday, and I realized that I probably have to clean up in it because I have an art uh, a project graveyard that's about three terabytes big. Because like I I allow myself too much. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes you can blind yourself to a project. And then you either need a fresh pair of eyes. I just had a delivery the other week where I simply didn't see that there was something that, was invi that wasn't there. It was, in it was invisible. It was integral to the scene. We were delivering it to a customer. And I was looking at it. I was like, yeah, that looks great. Because I've been looking at it for three weeks nonstop. And then uh, I, one of the art, my art director looked at it and was like, this thing's missing. It's like, what do you mean? Oh, oh yeah, it is. You stare yourself blind at projects all the time. Um, and it's so important to not, like, be super prideful about it. To, to allow other people and to allow yourself to ask other people, like, Hey, I made this. Can you tell me, like, what would make it better? Or, like, is there something wrong? And then if the person just tells you it looks like shit, then stop listening to them. They're not worth worth your time. If somebody, on the other hand, is telling you, well, I like what you did, but that's not really fitting in with the rest of it. Like, um, I, you made a, if you made a little room, a little vignette, and you made the walls yellow, and it's supposed to be really nice and really, really warm and sunny, but the yellow you used has a bit too much green in it. A person who will give you good feedback will tell you, Everything looks good, but that yellow's off. It's not giving off the vibe the rest of the scene is. It's a bit too. It, it, they might not know it's a bit too green, but it's, they will. They will know like the the yellow is disgusting. Because that will start looking like rot. It'll start looking like that. And unless that's what you're going for, that's not what you want. So you go and you rework that yellow. You make sure that that yellow looks good. Constructive criticism which too often, in my experience, just becomes criticism. So, I decide that, or I've decided, constructive criticism is not good enough. I need helpful criticism. And that, you can only get from people who have internalized that they don't need to shit on everything. Because if somebody's giving you constructive criticism, but they're being a dick about it, don't listen to them. Like, Simply because they're being a dick more than anything else. Oh, I like this. All right. Let's see what we can 
get out of this little boy. So I think, what are we missing? We're missing the inflate and the pinch and then the chisel brushes and the snake hook. Snake hook's good. Okay, so I can come back to the scales and top here next time any of you have questions and do a bit more of there. But we should probably go over a few more tools just to like show you guys a little bit of what you can do. So the inflate brush, for example, is quite cool because it takes what you already have and just, you know, blows it up like a balloon. And while you're thinking, like, this has limited um, uses, it doesn't really. It has a lot of really good uses um, because I can use it to either frame things, you can see here, make a nice little round, uh, I think it's called a um, floret. Like if you make a little something like that, you can see I can create small round shapes here, or things in there. You could use it to make teeth. Whoop. Make big old knobbly teeth. Yeah, that becomes real goony. I like that. I'm not gonna do all of them like this because I have other ways of making teeth as well. So you can also do, like, technically, you could also do teeth like this by moving it and holding down Alt. Um, so, yeah, one of the big uses of the inflate brush, I find, is particularly if you do have teeth. So let's bring back one of these teeth. One of the things you tend to want to do with fantasy creatures, you don't do it as much in realistic creatures, but you want to do it in fantasy creatures. So you want to do like, you want to show that these teeth are bursting through the gums. So the gums are like raw and around it like this, just to frame it. You can use the inflate brush really, really well for that. You can also use it for, uh, if you wanted to insinuate your nostrils more, you can do that. Let's see, I'm getting a little bit more bounce on it. A little bit more life, a little bit more chunk. Uh, I actually think my ears could use that a little bit more here. Yeah, look at that. It's going to give us a nice, hard shadow and definition there. What about our eyes? Eyes can use a little bit extra here. going to smooth it out but I still you see I still have that ridge so I have this thing underneath it and you could come in with your slash brush and just just ever so gently come in and make that wrinkle and you want to make wrinkles like fairly irregular like a lot of the time I will see people doing here's a wrinkle there's a wrinkle I'm done no as much as possible, you probably want to start and you want to stop and you want to change your size uh, because wrinkles, wrinkles are so much more irregular than we think they are. And to get them to look right, we do actually need to start like really making them irregular and add crow's feet, stuff like that. <laughs> well, you know, the dragon's going to be left on the school server, so you're welcome to it. A thing also, like, because I'm freestyling fairly much here, right? A thing that can sometimes help is if you're doing, if you're doing a, an animal, then you don't want to do this. But if you're doing something that has to have like a slight bit of intelligence, start giving it a personality. Because that's going to start defining a lot of the, um, <laughs> yeah, roll for initiative. It's going to start to define a lot of the design choices you make because you are, for all intents and purposes, designing something here. And like, if we if we went along and said, well, this guy, this this guy is a southern, a southern, uh, a southern charlatan. Well, then we do need to start changing up a little bit because then I would do, I'd really start getting this smile up here. I'd start getting that bigger, and I'd start to ins insinuate with the inflate brush that we just used, start to go like, yeah. Let's bring this up here. He is smiling. He's smiling. We want this to be as 
big of a grin as possible. We could even go as far as to move this whole thing like that. And of course we're warping some of the details here, but we're still getting like the thing we're wanting. We want to communicate that this guy is not to be trusted. So let's give him a smile that's not to be trusted, right? Uh, maybe bring that a little bit in. Again, just Morse code technique going slide. Let's get that in there. And now you can see like even this part up here is super flat. It doesn't have like a rictus grin, grin like, but it does have that like, well, howdy. Uh, snake oil, so uh, Moods is asking what is snake oil? Snake oil is something that uh, charlatans were trying to sell in the States to fight off arthritis for miners and cowboys, which was a big problem for them. And most of the time, it was just a bit of vinegar and in water or alcohol. Get into D and D. D and D is hella fun. But be warned, D and D is also one of them things that once you start, you don't really stop. If you like it, it just sort of becomes a thing that's always there, and you always want more, and it's it's always great. Let's smooth out this down here. See. Um. Yeah, so this is actually a thing. I don't think I've mentioned it for a while. I don't. I definitely know I haven't mentioned it today. There's a weird human tendency uh, to compartmentalize tool use and crafting and stuff like that, that once you've used a tool, you don't want to go back to it. And I need to tell you, just you just got to get over that as soon as possible. You need to get over that. And you need to allow yourself to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that's going to allow you to work better, faster. There's no reason to make a tool do something it's not meant to do. Oh, so let's go here. Let's just slightly smooth that out. Let's get... Because now we can see, like, because the grin has so much more weight to it, it feels fake. It has weight. It's not, like, because natural, a natural smile will tend to reach the eyes. It's going to move out. It doesn't have, like, it's not heavy. It's not forced. This seems kind of heavy because my cheeks are being pulled down. But if I give you a real smile, see? Not heavy at all. It's not just because I lift up my eyebrows a lot when I give you a real smile, but it's also because the way my cheeks move is different when I'm doing my school photo smile. Get like these dimples down here, everything becomes kind of heavy. And if I do a, a genuine smile that I would do towards a friend or a loved one. Those are two very different smiles and the fake smile comes off as creepy. And that's sort of what we want to get here. We want to make this heavy. We want to make it fake. We want to make it so that he doesn't like giving you this smile. The smile's a part of the act. And what we can actually do to make that even stronger is we can make the eyes angry. So again, we don't have eyes in here right now. We will, but we don't have any right now. Make the eyes angry. Again, he doesn't like this smile. This is just like, like just as much f a performance for him that he is putting on for you. He doesn't want you to be happy. He doesn't want you to think he's happy. So just furring the brow, we can even go back to our move brush and we can make this like the back end here a little bit open and then the front end here, we can make that real scowling.
It works on all tools, yes. Do be careful, because it's aggressive. When I say it's aggressive, I can show you. If you make it too big, so this is what decides, the size of this decides how much effect the smooth tool has. My dragon's gone. It's gone. Control set. But you really start, yeah. So, smooth tool works on everything. Let's start coming in here, give this a little bit more. Yeah, that's an untrustworthy grin. That's where we want it to be. Exactly. So. All right. So, uh, just a quick one. The pinch brush. You pinch things together. Pinch, pinch. Mr. Pinchy. And uh, for one thing is, like, if you made scales and they're very far from each other and you want them to be, like, tighter, it's a really nice thing just to be able to pull these things tighter. Now, you might lose a little bit of definition between them, but that's all right. We can always go in and restructure that definition, create more, like, contrast between them. Uh, keep it fairly small, but you can see here I'm getting these really tight scale patterns suddenly where the scales are being pulled together instead of, you know, just my freehanding stuff. And that's becoming very snaky. And then I can come in with an extremely small slash brush and I can really draw these in. You can also start by doing this. Um, it depends on if you're doing more crocodile, more snake. I tend to think that this looks a little bit like fake. Um, so I like using, I like drawing them in, then pinching them, and then getting these sort of random, more natural shapes here. And again, like you can plan things out. You can also learn the way snake uh, scales work to a scary level and then have that in your back hand forever um, for those. 16 times you need to do a snake through your career, but you know, that's not bad knowledge. And let's work this. Oh, perfect. We're at this point. So, Seabrush Core Mini has some limits. Seabrush Core has some limits as well, because I remember one of you saying that you were working Seabrush Core, not Seabrush Core Mini. This is really scary if you don't know what's going on. This is just telling us Seabrush or Maxon would like to sell you more product. We don't really need it. Again, like this here, you can see I have an active polygon count of 775,000 polygons. That's more than you would ever need for a game model or for a movie model because it makes it's unworkable for anything other than sculpting software. And now it's taking it down to 300,000. So that's all it's done. I can even control Z and I'm back up to 750,000. To avoid getting that annoying pop-up, if you don't like getting the pop-up, right, and you want to do it by manually, you have this high, medium, and low. High will take it down to 300 or to 500. Medium will take it down to 300. And low will take it down to 150,000 polygons. But let me just show you what happens when we do this. So, right now, I have some areas that have extreme dense geometry. And that's in here. That's these places I've been carving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of waste here and there's literally, there's so few ways of me fixing this properly. Like I could go in with a fairly big smooth, go away with fairly big smooth brush and I could start doing like this and it's going to start, go away and it's going to start like sorta doing a little bit of what I want, but not enough. On the other hand, a thing I could do is I can simply go up here and I can press the mid button myself. Then I know 
that when I do this, it's going to reduce it to 300,000 polygons. And you guys can now see what is the effect on the topology. It takes flat areas and reduces the amount of geometry that is there. While it takes areas where it needs high amount of geometry, like these curves, I, or like scales I just made, and lets them have more. So it keeps these shapes. And before you ever start thinking, well, I'm never going to use the low one, let me just use the low one. Did anybody see a difference there? Anybody at all? Because I just took away half the amount of geometry I have, and there's no difference because the algorithm is like the algorithm that runs on this is so good that it doesn't like you don't see it. Look at these giant flat areas and how few polygons are there. Those are what's being moved around and allowing me to work more efficiently and around the constraints that CBrush is or that Maxon is giving us. And I can just go back to sculpting now. And of course, this is going to, you know, sculpting like this with these type of uh, small slash brushes, stuff like that, are, is going to create some extremely dense geometry that I might or might not want. Meh. I can take it or leave it. But a cool thing for all of you who are looking at your dragon and going, I really want horns we have something called the snake hook tool. So this is really good for making teeth and really good for making horns. Um, just a quick one here, let me show you. Let's get a proper angle on that, you see? Very good, very nice teeth. This is your move brush with extra steps. And let me show you what I mean when I, when I say extra steps. When you use your move brush, all you do is you're moving around existing geometry. Not creating new stuff, just create it. You're just moving around what you already got. Snake hook makes new geometry. So it means you have more geometry to work with. And so we can make horns. They do come out a little bit two dimensional. Like, you do see that it's kind of flat up here. So while they're really good at creating dynamic shapes in one dimension, you do need to come in and you like, I uh, just need to adjust this and it needs to come out a bit better and stuff like that. It needs to be a more natural curve to it. Boo, 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 boo. So there's a lot of things to consider when you're working this with the snake hook, but it works. It's really good. Um, it's even so good that I've heard some people use it as their move brush. Um, I have tried to experiment with that. I am not completely sure I am sold on it, but I, I don't hate it. So yeah. Uh, let's get rid of that second set. Yeah. I want to do a more... I want to do like this. And I'm just going to slightly shape this. I do want it to be like budding horns. So like these are the small ones that are coming out. And then I want some bigger ones coming out here. Don't want them to come straight up. I want bigger ones. And let's do like this. Again, you do see they're fairly flat in that one dimension there. So I will use my move brush to just give them a bit more shape. And again, I have a lot more experience than you, so that's why it's that this quick for me to get these shapes out. There are people out there with more experience than me that can put me to shame in my speed. Ooh. Slide inflate. Don't be afraid of the inflate brush. Do, do give it a little bit of love in case things get too flat because we can always carve into them later. Uh, 
need to slow down a little bit. There you go. So, and here, while we're on our inflate brush, is when we can do, again, our border, like I said, you could do with your teeth, you can create these nice borders for your horns. Uh, just a heads up, bootcamps. Da, 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 da. Oh, is it? I thought we we had two hours. Oh well. So yeah, and just like that, um. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, lock the door and keep Christian out of here and just show you guys a quick little thing. So some of you guys might have been seeing I've been avoiding doing eyes, and that's because doing eyes in Seaworth Corp Mini is a little bit weird. Um, because we are locked to only having one piece of geometry at a time. Now we could export this and take it into Blender, put in a few spheres as eyes, very simple, quick fix, and would give us a lot of extra love. Uh, it would also allow us to render it out, retop it, do a bunch of extra work on it. But if you do want eyes straight inside Seabrush Core Mini, find Chisel Creature, and then the one I find works the best for dragons is I2 inside Chisel, Chisel Creature. This will project an eye onto your creature. That's all right, DevCode. You're also you were five hours ahead, as far as, far as I remember. That's a bit rough. Yeah. Um, you can even do yourself like if you don't want to do all the wrinkle sculpting and stuff like that, you can create an MTI that's just ready to receive that sphere inside of Blender. Now, before you go, and that's not all, but wait, there's more, because we have more eyes. We can go really bug-eyed. I kind of like that. I kind of like that a lot. We can go more human-eyed. That is absolutely cursed. We will never speak of that again. Uh, we can do a basic eye. Nah, not convinced about. Though we are getting some of that Mata Mata Turtle in there now, which isn't bad. Hmm. We also have the biggest chisel brush in here, the biggest projection brush. Because what this does is just it projects something onto your mesh from whatever angle you set down with your pen. Now in here, we have so many tools. We have so many tools. We can give our creature anime eyes. There you go, senpai. Love me. No, let's not. <clears throat> But we have so many things. And some people feel like it's cheating using these. Don't. It's not. It's literally a tool. With, like, with my few years of experience behind me, right? I have amassed not just a collection of things that I have made, but a collection of parts. Which means if I need to do a dragon, or if I need to do a minotaur, or if I need to do any sort of creature, if I need to do a human, I have cow legs, I have lizard legs, I have cat legs, I have human bodies that are ready to just receive a face. And then, then you work from that. You don't need to start from scratch every time. But... You can, you can use these things as templates and then make something new and interesting from them. And that will also, it will speed up your process. It'll give you a better place to start because you're getting some of the, the principle or some of the like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and it, 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 it gives you some of the, uh, the um, what the fuck is it called? Like if you're starting from a human base mesh, you're getting the proportions of the human body given. 
and then you can start roiding up the biceps, making those really big, or you can start making the face weird, or you can start sculpting Jason Statham if you want to, or anybody else. And you can see that these things, like, it's okay to start from there. You gotta learn how to do the anatomy. You gotta learn how to do the proportions at some point. But it's okay to start from there and get that underneath your hand, get some good experiences, create some nice things. Get a little bit of confidence before you start ruining yourself with it. Incidentally, this is also where I would go and I'd get my teeth. And at this point, where you're, start, you're doing detail work now, right? You can press X on your keyboard. You can turn off symmetry. And that means I can make my guy miss a tooth. Or two, because I can start, I can turn on symmetry again here. And what we're actually gonna get, you can see, he's asymmetrical. He's missing a tooth on one side. Or you can give him a sharp tooth on one side. Because that gives you that real stupid look, and that's perfect. Yeah, uh, as B Blaze was saying, like th this whole thing with the eyes that I'm going through uh, really showcases how important eyes are for us and how quickly it can just go horribly, horribly wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Sadly, I am uh, I'm here as a gift and as a treat to you from... Uh, because I, I do work at a, uh, at a film studio. Well, film studio. I work at a, at a, at a VFX studio. So it, it, I have other commitments most days. It's just, you know, Christmas time and I miss teaching. But I will be here the next three weeks. So, you know. Oh, how cursed can we make this? Yeah. Oh, that's actually not bad. That's kind of cool. Yeah, that's good. That gives him like that real charlatan. Actually, goes over like it goes away from being a dragon and turns into a bit of an imp. I don't hate that. All right. Yeah. Sorry, you were promised a specific time, and I'm going over time. My bad. Um. Thank you, everybody, for coming here. You are, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope to see you again next week where we will be doing blender modeling stuff. In the past, I've been doing a barrel. I don't know if that has been changed. I will be informed or, and we will all be pleasantly surprised next week. <laughs> well, a lot of it, it, it again, yeah, so much as modesty and fit, nice subtle tips a lot of it is subtle tips and a lot of it is also just learning how the brushes work in your hand um a lot of it is just getting things getting it under it and like i spend so much time on just sculpting things because i think it's fun like like said i got a sculpting app for my tablet well not even for my tablet for my wife's 16 year old tablet that can still run it fairly smoothly a little bit of lag but not a lot so yeah um so yeah thank you all for coming i hope to see you back next week and uh yeah check us out check out the discord join the discords christian send the discord link um and send us screenshots of it i guess christian will get me back on the discord probably Yep. All right. Christian, Discord link. <laughs> I'm I'm sure uh, that that Christian will throw up a Discord link very soon. <sighs> there you go. And with that, thank you all for tonight, and I will see you in the future.